Hello, my name is Merlin Mar Johnson, and welcome to another episode of Copper Bottomed. Uh, this week, there's plenty of news. Uh, I'm looking at the results preceding the 6th of November uh, in terms of expiration results, but there's also been a lot of market news just this week. So uh, let's get straight into it. In terms of the market news, I think in in the junior space, uh, the most eye catching and the most exciting was um, the the uh, the fact that Barrick Gold has invested twenty four million dollars um, or twenty three point four million dollars into Hercules Silver uh, with their um, on the back of the uh, copper intersection uh, potentially clipping the top of a porphyry or porphyry style mineralization uh, a few weeks ago. So within a month of the, the copper mineralization or the copper hit, uh, here we have Barrick Gold uh, putting money into Hercules Silver. I think Barrick were already a shareholder, uh, but still it's a really interesting thing. They've taken uh, 13% of the company. The um, The market capitalization of Hercules is now uh, $214 million Canadian, so about $155 US million. Now this is really interesting interesting it just shows that the the, the major um, mining companies whether they are gold or uh, base metal uh, companies are really 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 focused on um, on copper uh, and the and the, the potential pipeline for for um, copper development stories and copper exploration uh, when I spoke with Mark Bristow a few months ago uh, and I was telling him about some of the copper exploration that I'm doing he said, uh, give me a call if you think you've got a target which is um, potentially going to host 5 million tonnes of contained copper, I mean, th th which is, of course, an absolutely enormous deposit. Um, so there's, and in, in a sense, good luck with finding that because there are so few of those big discoveries being made. Um, but here the action speaks slightly differently to the words, as in this is just one drill hole, um, that they've got into the copper. Obviously, there's some good geological potential there. And if you look through the core photographs, which they included in the news release, you can see that it's a pumped system. Um, incidentally, I interviewed uh, Chris from uh, Hercules Silver 18 months ago when it was still Bald Eagle Gold. Uh, and I really liked the fact that it was a pumped system. So... Um, uh, the geological indications are there and they were there um, and they've, they've always been there. Um, and obviously that is what um, Barrick is investing into. They're investing into the geological potential of the area. But it's very interesting, the indicative that they're going for copper. Um, there is more market news in the sense that Rio Tinto and Cadelco have uh, teamed up um, in a new joint venture in northern Chile called Nuevo Cobre, New Copper. Um uh, Ritinto's kind of taken out the Pan American Silvers 57% in Agua La Falda, Agua de la Falda, and so they're they're going to be starting exploration there. That's in northern Chile, and it's that's what's in interesting about that is threefold. One is it shows um, it kind of re reaffirms uh, Chile's exploration potential and investment destination. Chile is an investment destination. Two, it shows that uh, Ritinto is willing to go into uh, early stage exploration, um, joint ventures, and three, it shows that Cadelco, in its own um, backyard, is dealing with um, uh, operating issues at its mines, and it's obviously kind of capital constrained. Um, their production profiles are, um, are declining. You know, they've got a lot on their plate, and so they're they're bringing in exploration partners in Chile, which is which is really interesting. Um, another. A uh, bit of kind of uh, the majors are looking for copper news comes from an interview that uh, the, new, the the CEO of Newmont, Tom Palmer, gave with an um, it, with an Australian news channel. There's a five minute video uh, which is um, uh, moderately interesting. Um, I took away from it the emphasis that he was making about copper. He repeats it several times through the interview. You know. Um, so you've got Barrick looking for copper, you've got Newmont looking for copper, you've got the copper mining companies looking for copper. It, it, it's game on. And another indication that the market is um, willing to fund copper, there was the announcement on um, Monday that Eero Copper have done a $105 million bought deal. Eero Copper is a $1.5 billion Canadian, so $1.1 billion US company listed in Toronto with assets in Brazil. Um, $105 million. 
available for that. So th- that's really interesting. And then um, I know it's not directly copper, but I, I couldn't help but notice a tweet by um, Javier Blas, who's the uh, energy correspondent for Bloomberg. He wrote, wrote, he's talking about the bananas of energy policy, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything soon. And he, he was talking about that the, the the governments don't really seem to be incentivizing uh, new production and costs are running out of control. Um, and he was saying that this is a huge challenge for policymakers, that the investment is just not going into new production. And I felt that that was very, very applicable to the resources sector because a few weeks ago, Tech Cominco came out talking about its cost overruns at its um, Quebrada Blanca project in northern um, Peru, uh, northern Chile, sorry. Um, and uh, they're running a site visit at the moment uh, for investors and analysts and they put out a, a fascinating, a huge presentation, um, and I went through it. So this just came out early this week, and they're talking about. There's, I, I highly recommend that anybody goes to the tech website and looks at the um, Quebrada Blanca site visit uh, presentation, because um, there are loads of really good photographs and maps of what a major copper development project looks like this is going this is the largest engineering project in chile at the moment and it's um the the, the mine is up at four thousand meters or um, or higher the mine site and it comes you know there are pipelines and infrastructure and desalination plants and port and it's it's a massive massive project and remember that this is just to produce th- about three hundred thousand tons of copper it's 275 to 315 is the um is is the range so Huge infrastructure to produce a decent amount of copper, but when you look at the the, the, the copper market of twenty five million tons, and we'll go through some of their slides, um, you realise that this is the amount of work that is required to do this kind of thing. So um, remember how much effort is required to produce copper. So here we are um, in the presentation. There's quite a lot of um, about. Uh, Quebrada Blanca, and they talk about the Q3 revisions to Q to Q, the 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 um, Quebrada Blanca expansion capital cost. And remember, this project when it was first mooted in 2000, and or um, I think the numbers came out in 2018 or 2019. It was a 5.2 billion dollar build. We've already seen the capital cost increase from 5.2 to to 8.2 billion dollars, and that was a billion and a half was associated with. Um, COVID and et, et cetera, and the change of scope. But we've just had an increase from $8.2 billion to $8.8 billion. And um, there's this slide in there, and it says 50% of the increase is due to change in scope. This always, always kills the budgets of these projects is change in scope. So don't do any shortcuts on your planning. Make sure you've got your um, metallurgical work done and your resource work done. It's much much cheaper to do the work beforehand than to try and do it mid thing but anyway so 50 percent of the increase is due to change in scope demob delay and delays in the construction of the port offshore shore facilities remember this is a really complicated infrastructure project from port to um link infrastructure um dewatering and all that kind of stuff thickening and concentration and then the mine site itself they've also put in a big another big contingency and they're also working with it obviously the contractor claims and the commercial settlements so there's obviously a big snafu there i haven't got the detail i haven't listened to it but i just thought this was a really interesting slide um the site visit to quebrada blanca it's been a uh, it's been accompanied by a lot of the, the 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 tech senior management and um they have uh, provided a a commercial overview, a financial review of the company, but they've also done a market review. Um, and I've just nicked a few of their, not nicked, but I'm borrowing a few slides. I've, I've put the source and uh, I've referenced and I, um, I really respect the work that tech has done. And I think it's worthwhile just running through some of these, uh, some of their observation about observations about the market. And what are they saying here? They're saying that the mine supply is going to peak in 2026. And they say the project pipeline is at the lowest level in decades, despite higher prices. So just just let that sink in. The project pipeline is at the lowest level in decades. Um, So there are long permitting timelines timelines and lack of investment. Um, Yes, there's committed mine production to add 3.1 million tons by 2026. But remember that it takes 17 years or so to get a 
big project developed, uh, maybe less if you've got a small project from exploration through to uh, first production. But CRU, a, a very well respected research unit, um, commodities research unit, I think it is, um, they estimate another $120 billion is required to fill the, the gap for the next 10 years, $120 billion of investment. I mean, if you think about uh, the, the, the estimate of $120 billion required to fill the, the gap over the next uh, 10 years, and if you just think to yourself that perhaps a, at the top end of expenditure, not more the top end, but um, let's say an average copper mine is going to require $5 billion. We've just seen that Cabral de Blanca has, has ballooned out to uh, $8.8 .8 billion. But let's say uh, the average is $5 billion, and with CIU estimates you need $120 billion. That's 24 of those big mines that need to come in to, to, to fill that gap. And it, it's just so hard to see where that is going to come from. Um, Tech, do talk about the no shortage of available projects, over 15 million tons of uncommitted projects. And I, I, I don't know what the detail is in that, but um, they also go on to say that the shovel-ready projects um, are lower, I think they mean fewer or lower in tonnage um, potential than 2016. And you can see that here. So they've got this great chart here, which is showing the 10-year forward projects, which shows snapshots in time going back to 2011. So in 2011, in year uh, eight, there was going to be another four and a bit million tons of production. By 2016, in year eight, there was going to be about, um, whatever that is, two and a half million tons of new production. And uh, you can look at year 10 as well. Uh, but right now, 2023, in 10 years time, there's less than two million tons forecast to come um, of, of new supply forecast to come up. So it's really interesting. Then um, the next sl slide in their presentation talks about copper concentrate demand growing. So smelters are being built in China and outside of China. So um, what this shows you is that the, the bottleneck in the future isn't necessarily going to be at the smelting or the processing level. It's going to be at the mine production level. Um, I'll skip through these. Um, and then they talk about the long-term copper metal demand growth and of course um remember that we've got supply declining from 2026 and you've got demand rising um i do have my doubts about some of the punchier elements of wind uh electrification of transport and solar um just because looking at the the recent cost increases of offshore wind of of solar deployment i, th I think there are going to be challenges in deploying that. However, I'm absolutely sure that electrification and the, the grid infrastructure is going to be strong, and there will be a big push on, on um, electrifying transport. So um, I'm kind of in the in the mid range in terms of the the let's call it the energy transition um, range of forecasts. But I fundamentally I'm very very um, uh, clear on my support of the the, the base loan demand growth is 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 right there and in the more that we electrify the more our population um comes out of poverty towards let's call it um middle class uh status by owning a car and a fridge and a um and have electricity in one's house uh that is going to be a huge cop demand um pull going forward so the the demand side is robust the supply side is weak especially from three years out um, and uh, they've got one more chart here and they talk about the long-term outlook for copper and they say there has to be a new floor price for future production. So um, there's the classic crocodile's mouth of um, mine supply gap by 2040. Remember that uh, 17 years away, 2040 is only um, uh, 17 years away and that's the average amount of time that it takes to to develop a copper mine from a kind of post-discovery and of course the pre-discovery timeline is unknown so uh, their main conclusions are demand growth is supported by the energy transition tick supplies to peak in 2020 six before declining okay and the requirement for primary mining will need significant investment so there's going to be shortage of copper tons available 
uh, it was, and this is a really, really interesting thing, is that mine production grew 7 million tons in the last 20 years. It's only grown 7 million tons in the last 20 years, and it needs to double that in 17 years. So I think that's a really, really key point. Um, we need to produce twice as much copper, new copper, bring new copper mines into production in the next 17 years than we've achieved in the past 20 years. And remember that copper is a mature industry. Uh, it's very hard to find new tons. Uh, so if you are in a position of finding new tons, you should be in a good place. Um, and of course, the higher copper prices don't immediately translate into bigger margins because costs have increased as well. Um, but it does, and, and this is very much affected by the the um, devaluation of the of of fiat currency by um, you know all of the money printing that was going on in um, uh, during COVID and the, well, quantitative easing since the, the global financial crisis. And well, you can go right back to 1971. But um, effectively, this means is that we need. Uh, copper prices need to be higher for longer. So with that said, kind of macro aside, let's go on to the um, the news releases of the last week. And there are uh, only four, um, which is good because I've been talking about the market for a while. Um, Arizona Sonora and Copper, Valhalla Metals, Benton Resources, and Imperial Metals Corporation. Let's get straight into it. Now, um, Arizona Sonora and Copper Company. I, I know this company well. I've spoken with George Ogilvy a number of times. I've interviewed him. Uh, it's a great company. Um, they've got a really good asset. They're in Arizona. Uh, their share price is you know, at a at a five year low. I can't remember how, how long that chart. That's a, that, that's a two year um, share price chart. Um, it's at a multi year low. The the market is beating it up. That's fine. You know, in a sense, all of these copper stocks are being beaten up at the moment and that is it is so interesting when one realizes when one looks at the the longer term outlook for the copper price that i've just been speaking about now despite my admiration for george and the fact that this is a good asset and it's a good company the news release that they put out i think is right dog's dinner right dog's breakfast because it's so complicated now i'm um steeped in dealing with these things. I I spend a lot of my time looking through news releases and I had to work so hard to understand what the hell is going on in this news release because it's kind of all over the place. So um, whoever's, <laughs> whoever's writing <laughs> these news releases, oh my goodness, um, please make it simpler. Goodness me. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm going to try and pull out the key points, even though it jumps around a lot. Uh, so the first thing they say is in the headline, they drill 1.97% uh, total copper over 165 meters at Park Salia. Good. That's a great result. 165 meters, of almost 2% copper. Super. And they begin drilling uh, south of the Park Salia deposit. Good. Okay, so they one result coming from Park Salia, and they're starting to drill south of Park Salia. Okay, here they talk about they announced drill assays from five holes at Cactus East, and four from Park Salia. Okay, so we've got nine holes being announced, and they're drilling at thirty-eight meter drill spacings, demonstrating the con continuity and thickness of mineralization. Well, they could. It, they come on to talk about here is that they're doing development drill spacing. So this is infill work. I mean, you've got to jump around and put these things together. So if this is infill drilling, so these are nine infill drill holes. And then they go on to talk about um, the mainspring property here, which is the exploration thing. And then they jump on to talk about the tonnage of the Park Salia deposit, which is something else over here. And they talk about the historic drilling. I mean, it's it's it, it, this is all over the show. So they talk about the exploration, you know, the drilling highlights. They lead to here saying exploration is targeting drill mineralization south of Park Salia. But then they, anyway, let's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's very, very confusing. But if you look at the map, they do have some good maps. What they've done is, let's come back to the very top here. Five holes at Cactus East and four from Park Salia. There's here's Cactus East. You can see underneath the old pit. Um, they, they got the map of the infrastructure, or the the the, the aerial image of the uh, the photograph of the uh, infrastructure and the and the land. 
And here is Park Salia here. So you've got four new holes here, five new holes here. This is all infill drilling, and that's fine. And if you look at the intersections, you can see that they are in the enriched zone above the primary sulfide material. And these are close spaced. These are infill drill holes, so it's not going to change the, well, it shouldn't really change the uh, the grade of the deposit in, in this sense. It's, this isn't going to um, transform the uh, the overall understanding of the resource. It's, uh, I, hopefully, it's just going to bring inferred to indicated resources, but they mention here, particularly, they're targeting the increase, the targeting definition of measured resources. So they're trying to bring this into the measured category so that um, mining, then, then you can really start working on the reserve planning. Um, now, I've just, they, they put in lots of cross sections, which is really good, very good quality work. I picked this one uh, from Park Salia down here, uh, principally because it shows you the the um, the soluble copper just drops right off in the primary, so you can get the you can leach the the copper in the enriched zone and in the oxide zone, but you can't leach it in the in the in the in the primary sulfides. So many good things at Arizona Sonoran. The share price is is uh, obviously going in the wrong direction, but I think that will sort itself out in time. I like the company, I like the asset. I mean, 165 meters at 1.97%, and they've got similar grades here. So th this is at east. So this is um, Cactus East, uh, 83 meters at 2.5% soluble copper. Wow. You know, that's th these are these are good results. This is That's a good, good, good result. However, the drafting of the news release, my goodness, it's a right old dog's dinner. Okay. Next, from a decent sized company to a minnow, um, we are now at uh, Valhalla Metals. It's got a market capitalization of $8 million. And when you look at the headline, you think, oh, wow, wow, look at this. Valhalla Metal reports high grade mineralization and it's from its maiden drill program and its flagship sun project, including 21 meters of 6.8% copper equivalent. It's like, woo, this is great. Why is the market capitalization only $8 million? You look at the share price, it's pretty blocky. Um, it's pretty undecided, a bit sideways over the last couple of years. Actually, they've, they've, they've held up remarkably well uh, in the last uh, nine months or so, but I guess that's a function of not even the last nine months. Where are we? This is the last uh, five months. I guess that's a function of, of not many people um, trading it. Then I read on, uh, pleased to announce the results from four dry diamond drill holes totaling um, 1,100 meters, so on average, kind of 275 meters each, uh, completed during the 2023 exploration program. And so that tells us um, something. It says that, they, that this is what they drilled. They drilled four holes this year. It shows A, that they're capital constrained, and B, that it's probably got a short operating window. And then you go, okay, the Sun Project located in the world-class Ambler Mining District Northwest Alaska. And then the, the the cogs start turning. I look at a map. Oh, Ambler, Trilogy Metals. This actually, Trilogy Metals, if you look at the Trilogy Metals share price, it's just been a um, uh, something you wouldn't want to ski down. I mean, it's been a 98% loss of value. And that's really a function of the infrastructure. It's, it's an infrastructure play. So uh, while these are, in theory, good um, results, actually, uh, it's kind of stuck in the queue behind the development infrastructure of Trilogy. So if Trilogy, if the infrastructure and the road and everything else get built, then this will have much greater value. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be me without saying you shouldn't be using copper equivalents on exploration results, particularly not on a maiden drill program. This is totally in contradiction, in my opinion, to what I think is very clear in the TSX guidelines. And then you can get into it. So um, when you start looking at it, 13.7 meters of 1.2% copper. So two thirds of the value or three fifths of the value is not in copper. And here, uh, 21 meters of 6.8, of which only 1.3% is copper, copper, as in copper. 
and everything else is something else. And you look a bit further, and oh, yes, look, there it is, the zinc grade. And then I go, me being me, I go to the tiny little notes at the bottom, which Turks works out how they do their um, copper calculation or their, their copper equivalent calculation. And it's all it's all a bit much. You know, they use a $3 copper, uh, they, here we go, they use a $3 um, copper price and they use a, a 110 zinc price and they assume 91% recovery uh, and 91% of copper and of zinc. And then they just they just are borrowing the the recoveries of the neighboring Arctic VMS deposit, that's Trilogy Metals, um, where remember that in Arctic, they, they it, it's not it's more kind of gold rich and so it's just a, a layer and layer and layer of assumption upon assumption upon assumption just don't do it um the ratio of zinc to copper here is is high zinc relative to copper so when you're doing these copper equivalents that will skew your copper grade because you're attributing more value to the zinc plus they haven't accounted for the fact that you only get 80 percent payable or thereabouts from the zinc so these are the copper equivalents are just a no-no don't go don't go near them so um next that is that is that is it right now we come to benton resources with a market capitalization of 24 million dollars uh forgive that um that that arrow that's in the wrong place but essentially um it's pointing at this spike here so this company has put out some news this volume and the share price has responded um you go to the News release from last week, Thunder Bay, Ontario, November the 1st, Benton Resources, pleased to announce it's received partial assays from its inaugural drill program at the Great Burnt Copper Gold Project in Newfoundland. Okay? So it's the inaugural drill program. Holds uh, one and two, both intersected excellent copper grades, including 4% copper over three and a bit meters, from 69 good i like the way i report that and eight percent copper over four meters from 82 good and in the whole uh that was in um that was in hole one and 8.3 meters over 13 meters wow from 169 including this um from 169 and it just i mean you know your, your head starts spinning and you've got to start sketching things out and then you go okay fine okay it's, it's getting complicated but basically, this is this is good grade stuff. And then you go, intervals reported for the uh, drilling are core lengths estimated to be 70% of true width. Good. I'm glad they write that in the, in the not in tiny print at the bottom. And then this is perhaps the kicker. Due to the success encountered in early drilling, they're expanding the ongoing drill program to a minimum of 4,000 meters. Good. So it's relatively shallow. It's high grade copper. It's in Newfoundland. All good. And then I started reading the rest of the first page of the news release, and it was like, oh my God, spare me. This is this, it just becomes one long um bit of kind of verbal diarrhea of kind of some geo geo talk. The companies uh, all eleven holes drilled to date have insect, intersected semi-massive and massive sulfides containing silk significant chalcopyrite copper mineralization. Its first priority is the expansion of the great burnt high-grade core in the main deposit, which has been extremely successful to date. It's kind of slightly in contradiction to the inaugural deposit, and then it just goes, holds dead lead 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 I mean, if you if you can read that, good luck to you. Um, I did find a bit right at the end, which says that the drilling from 2016 to 2020 at Great Burnt delineated a, a resource, uh, and that was 670,000 tonnes, um, at 3% copper and 480,000 tons at 2.35% copper. So indicated and inferred. The copper resource opens to the south and at depth. But my goodness, I, of course, when when I saw that um, that first page of that news release, it was, uh, heaven help me, you know, please, junior mining companies, get someone to draft your news release. And I looked at the website and the Val uh, and um, Benton Resources, um, it's got a kind of capital markets a savvy chairman and a geologist CEO, and you can tell. I mean, because crikey, I bet the CEO wrote that news, news reports. I, I'm sure he's a good guy. I'm sure he's a good geologist. But that drafting is is um, unimpenetrable. And I'm a geologist, and I, I'm I'm used to reading these these things. I just I have no idea how anybody in retail could uh, decipher what's going on. 
So, which is why I'm here, which is why I'm doing this. Uh, they did include a nice long section and they showed the, the two new holes they've drilled. Um, this is the first hole that hit um, 8% over 4 meters and 4% over 3 meters in the middle here. That's good. But remember, that's within the existing resource of 670,000 tons, maybe a million tons when you add in the inferred. But the other holes, which have got the the sulfides in, are actually expanding it down this side. So that's potentially interesting. And hole two, 8% over 13 meters, is actually outside the old uh, the, the projection of the old resource. Now, remember, this is a long section. I don't know what it all stacks up like because you can project things onto a plane quite easily, but they may not connect. Um, you know, that looks as if it's continuous. But if, if, if I showed you where they are uh, relative to each other, they're not next to each other. So it may look continuous, but it might not be. Let's see what's happening. What I'd like to see from this company is improved the drafting of the report so it's easier to read. I'd like to see some um, more cross sections uh, and I'd like to see some more drilling because I think this is actually really quite interesting. Uh, the last company here uh, is Imperial Metals Corp. Uh, they've got a market capitalization of $312 million Canadian and they've got a 30% share um, of the Red Chris mine. Um, so that's where their, their, their value is coming from. Now, they their share price is... Um, held up reasonably well in the last uh, year and they put out an expiration result here showing that they drilled 165 meters at 0.3 percent copper um, from whiting creek now this is quite interesting and i went to have a look at the map to see where it was and it's next to the old huckleberry mine is 8.5 kilometers in the straight line from the old mine and they put in a nice uh, simple cross section here much good work the mineralization remains open and there's clearly potential for further discovery in this unexplored area, underexplored area. And the, the Brian um, Kynuk, the, the, um, the president of Imperial says, ongoing exploration continues to expand the potential of various mineral zones. And he goes on to say the highest grades and the majority of production at the Huckleberry mine came from altered volcanic rocks. So that's interesting. And then the, the news release goes on to talk about the work that has happened in the last couple of years, which is mapping surveys, geophysics, um, geochemistry. They, they, they've done a pretty um, thorough job here, and they've got a bunch of anomalies, and they're continuing to work on it. Um, they've got mineralization in the stock, which is the, kind of the intrusion, and they've got mineralization in the surrounding volcanics. So um, it's a genuine target. I went to the reserves and resources statement, and I saw that... When Huckleberry Mine closed in 2016, because it's been on care and maintenance since then, the reserve grade was 0.32% copper with 0.01% uh, moly. So this intersection here is at the reserve grade. And I would suggest that if it closed in 2016, you're going to need to have higher grade material to revamp the resource and get the momentum to or kind of get the... Uh, get the front end going by having some high grade material so i think this is an encouraging result but more is needed and then i had a quick look in the uh, quarterly operations report and they uh, they say for the september quarter uh the huckberry mine can uh idle mine uh cost them two million dollars in operating costs so you know the holding cost on this is going to be somewhere around kind of seven seven or eight million dollars canadian per annum um Good exploration work, more needed. What I'd like to see from this, of course, is can they vector to any high grade? Um, it's not a company changing news release at the moment, but it's interesting that uh, work is ongoing and uh, hopefully they will find enough to be able to restart the mine because uh, A, we need more copper and B, I bet the, the local community and the local area and the local economy would benefit from the um, redevelopment of Huckleberry. So there we go. It's been a relatively long uh, copper bottom today. I hope it's been uh, interesting for you. I've certainly enjoyed digging deep into some of the stories and to some of these news releases. Um, what I would like to see from almost all of them is more clarity and better drafting of those news releases. It can be done. Um, thank you very much.